Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to reconvene here, uh, getting towards the end of the day, but uh, still exceptionally valuable material to cover. Uh, this section will look at uh, case study examples of coastal engineering, and Han Moritz and, and David uh, Michelson will be giving us a talk and then a, a panel discussion. Please. Thank you, and thanks for inviting Dave Michelson and myself to present to you today about some of the infrastructure requirements we have to meet with the Corps of Engineers. Um, the outline will be five elements to this talk. Um, two of the elements will be an introduction dealing with, first, what is the mission of the Corps of Engineers uh, to support a nation's infrastructure requirements for civil works, and then our culture and how we can align for alignment of collaboration. And then the next three elements will go through the activities that the Corps of Engineers has relevant to the coastal margin and uh, news in the PAC Northwest for Portland District and Seattle District Corps offices. Then we'll address the ch challenges that we face along our coastal margin, dealing with coastal navigation infrastructure, specifically the aging infrastructure. And then we'll summarize with some opportunities. Our Civil Works program, Corps of Engineers, is supported by about five is supported by about five billion dollars annually. It's a diverse portfolio of seven missions. But today I'll be spe specifically talking to you about navigation uh, along our coastal margin. Um, overall, the ports and waterways that the Corps, Corps is involved with uh, have a lot to do with our nation's uh, economic health. And waterborne commerce is by far the most efficient way to move commodities. The Corps offices are represented by regional commands named divisions, and each division has a number of districts that support the division. Also shown here are the regional associations for IUs. In this part of the world, the regional command for the Corps of Engineers is the Northwestern Division, and we'll be addressing the Seattle and Portland districts uh, uh, infrastructure today for you. Our culture, the Corps is mission-oriented and project-focused. Uh, uh, the Corps obtains data for our immediate project needs, and we're somewhat limited from attaining other types of data that don't fall within our immediate needs, in this case, coast supporting coastal navigation infrastructure. Uh, I want to emphasize that sometimes the core does not fully exploit or advertise the data that we collect. However, on the good side is that we're execution driven. Uh, we're very good at line, aligning resources to complete the task at hand. We can use this energy to collaborate with others when, when their tasks over, over, uh, overlap with our tasks. We are going, undergoing a cultural shift in the core though. We're trying to leverage resources across projects, looking at a systems-based approach. Bottom line today, for today's talk, though, I wanted to emphasize is our coastal navigation infrastructure has increased vulnerability. Uh, we need to ad address this by improving our adaptive management decision making. To do that, we need a good data feed. So bottom line is we need to share and utilize existing data sets as much as possible and the combined capabilities for ob observing, collecting, and analyzing future data sets. Portland District has 11 jetty inlets along its coast and we also operate 20 dams. Uh, here's what, the, what a dam looks like. It's a complicated system of infrastructure. Um, and then an inlet. This is a new port. It is also a system of infrastructure. These two business lines end up competing for re scarce resource maintenance dollars. So we have to make some hard decisions. The synopsis of our coastal navigation infrastructure is that through the Portland District's uh, ports, we convey $18 billion in water commerce, waterborne commerce each year. 11 jetty inlets compose 30 miles of structures out into the ocean, $2 billion of investment, and we're basically having to adaptively manage these, these uh, elements by basically doing just-in-time repairs to keep things from failing. We want to keep the function, but we don't want it to fail. And to do this requires frequent observation of forcing processes and responses. So when we take an inlet from its natural condition to an engineered inlet, we're basically investing a lot of money up front uh, to construct jetties and training structures and then follow on dredging maintenance activities. 
it ends up being a system with the channel as, a, as the centerpiece of, a, of the system. However, the morphology at the inlet is really what's going on. And we're working with nature to maintain the morphology which supports the jetties and sustains the navigation channel as a system. This, these sorts of systems are subjected to severe loading every year. We get in the pack northwest what is equivalent to a hurricane. Same scale, the bottom panel is a hurricane that's hitting Louisiana. Um, wave modeling and data. It's essential for understanding how our coastal infrastructure adapts to its life cycle. In addition, um, we need wave data. I think all of us need wave data, but the core also to make informed decisions regarding navigation, uh, utility, and safety. We highly utilize the CDIP and NDBC wave buoy data, real-time observations, and we really, really make the best use of shelf and nearshore bathymetry data. We can't do wave modeling without good bathymetry data. Here's a comparison of three different models, wave models, to estimate wave height. And um, in some places, the wave models agree. In other places, they do not. Now, this, this diversity in model results is actually helpful. Because by comparing models, we can reduce risk and uncertainty. It informs us about processes we may not be having fully defined. And it improves collaboration especially when different groups are doing the wave modeling and we're comparing results. Um, jetty loading, waves, it can be very severe. We can go from a fair condition jetty to a threatened condition jetty um, in just a matter of a year or two. So we have to maintain surveillance. In addition, where the jetties connect to shore, water level comes up, storm surge, those vulnerable parts of the jetties can fail. As you see here, a small breach opening resulted in the release of a significant amount of morphology into the inlet. Um, and then the last slide before I transition um, over to, to David Michelson is this. This is a time varying reliability plot for, the MC, uh, for a given jetty. And it starts basically when the jetty was begun, and then it's going through time to the present day. And you can see that the reliability has changed through time. Different repair uh, scenarios, different times when the morphology came out in response, to the jet, in response to the jetty construction, it protected the jetty. Now that morphology is receding, exposing the jetty to more, more vigorous lotion, ocean loading, and now we're in a state where the reliability is not so good. It's poor. And we are dealing with vulnerable infrastructure. Um, the, this type of evaluation requires extensive integration of observed wave data, water levels, wave model results, bathymetry and topo topographic data, jetty design equations. It all comes together from different elements, core elements, and different data suppliers that we use. David Michelson, I'll take over. Uh, David's with Seattle District. Thank you, Rod. Um, so, as Rod mentioned, as part of our maintenance, we do need to continue O&M dredging from annual year-to-year um, -year operations. Uh, so this is just an example of our, our dredging at, at um, our MCR, Columbia River. Um, and basically, our inlets on the, the coast is a combination dredging by government hopper dredges as well as... I'm sorry, is that better? Okay. <laughs> Um, so, as I was saying, uh, we're required to dredge annually at our, at our inlets, and um, here's a, a schematic of a private dredge and a hop, government hopper dredge. And um, in order to make educated decisions about what the shoaling is in our harbors, we need advanced uh, knowledge on the, the, these complex processes, how um, channels shoal in and um, where we should be place in our dredge material to um, make, make most beneficial use of um, the sediment. And to do that, we need uh, environmental forcing data such as tides, waves, currents, and wind, wind data. Um, this is an example of a split hole hopper placing dredge material um, at the, by the North Jetty at the Columbia River here. And, these type of uh, data help inform this decision making to um, still maintain safe navigation and uh, minimize impacts on ecological uh, species. 
So um, as I said, uh, we are all stewards of the environment. And in order to, to work within that environment um, and minimize uh, the challenges we face with uh, accomplishing our mission of, of uh, maintaining our, our navigation channels, uh, we need to work together collectively with our, our um, resource agencies and uh, fisheries um, to minimize these impacts to, to eco ecology. And, um, uh, and, and at the end of the day, it's going to benefit everyone. Uh, I'll transition into Seattle District infrastructure now. Um, we have projects that are on uh, outer coast, mainly three at West at Grays Harbor, Cooley, and um, also Willapa Bay uh, to the south, and, and the two in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and then 17 in Puget Sound. Uh, this graph on the right-hand corner just describes a general breakout of commercial cargo, fisheries, and recreation. Um, Seattle Tacoma are the main um, economic commercial cargo ports, but it's important to note that commercial fisheries on the outer coast at Grace Harbor um, and, uh, and other harbors, Bullapa Bay, are also important contributors. And um, these are all stakeholders at our projects. Uh, as uh, a tie into what Rod talked about earlier, our infrastructure is aging, and also the processes that are forcing on this infrastructure are, are changing. It's non-stationary. Um, this is just an example of some of a wave model at Grace Harbor from 1999 to 2008. In that 10-year period, the channel morphology um, in the, the harbor throat scoured out um, a very large degree as a result of this uh, Damon Spit accreting and growing to the south. As a result, it refocused some of the wave energy on um, our own um, infrastructure seen here at Westport. And we've noticed uh, quite a bit more wave energy hitting the structure that it was originally not designed to um, withstand. So these are the type of issues we're facing. And we need to evolve along with uh, the processes that are um, forced on our structures. Uh, other missions we deal with are uh, flood damage reduction. Here's a project at Willapa Bay that we were working with with, our, uh, with the stakeholder, the Shoalwater Indian Reservation. Uh, it's a small area here, um, and they've seen massive erosion um, to their protective um, barrier islands out in front of the reservation. And um, we engage in a multi-agency study here with USGS Ecology and our um, uh, engineering Research Development Center out of Vicksburg to, to look at if there was an actually feasible um, plan to where we could minimize this flooding risk to the reservation and erosion of their, their, um, their land. And um, we determined that the geology did prove to be, in fact, capable of providing this um, through this hard point, act as an anchor here, and um, determine that uh, barrier island restoration could could um, have a positive impact on the reservation. And in order to make these type of decisions, we need geological data along with um, hydrodynamic data, uh, namely water levels at Toke Point were, were key in determining what the storm surges were and, and uh, waves offshore at the sea dip buoys. Um, and we were able to look at scenarios and, and um, just look at different risk reduction scenarios um, where we, we could um, have a positive impact on, on flooding in the reservation. Uh, one thing to also point out is that coastal observations also serve a broader user base, uh, inland uh, flooding as well. Uh, uh, one key thing was a, a crisis that we had at one of our dams, Howard Hansen, just uh, two years ago. Um, after a, a large uh, January storm, um, a depression was found in the abutment. And um, uh, we had to ha have a better data to make decisions on how to operate the dam. Um, so there was an, a, a crisis with the dam failure itself. We needed um, to know what was coming so we can make better decisions about how to operate the dam to, min to reduce the risk of a catastrophic um, impact to the infrastructure. So um, 
there was an atmospheric river observation station put out at Westport, and this was a key collaboration between the Corps' meteorologist and uh, National Weather Service and NOAA's environmental um, research group out of Boulder, Colorado. And um, they installed this to get better wind profiles on these atmospheric river events. Um, that's just an example of, of this. Um, so just the key, key data products and needs that the core works with. Uh, wave buoys, water levels are key ones. Uh, Argus webcams give us more information about how that offshore wave data that's at the, the buoys comes in and, and how it impacts the actual coastlines and the harbors. Um, uh, like people have said, Wave Watch 3, ET Surge, all these, mo these models capable of providing um, real close time data to make uh, decisions on how, if we need to respond to some type of event beforehand to prevent a more um, catastrophic um, failure scenario. Um, what data is needed? Uh, more water level data, more spatial temporal coverage. Um, this is gonna be an issue as sea level change issues become uh, more at play. Um, I would say this network needs to be expanded more into inland waters, Puget Sound particularly, where vertical land movement is highly variable. Um, same thing for ecosystem restoration, um, where tidal, restora tidal hydrology restoration is a driving factor of the management measures. Uh, wave, wave buoys, um, similar, expanding the network, um, short-term instrumentation for tactical deployments. Um, and then just understanding episodic events that drive sediment transport. These are all regional sediment management type of qu answers and questions that we have and we can learn from examples at the mouth of the Columbia River to implement to other systems such as Puget Sound and other um, harbors on the outer coast, Grace Harbor, Willapa Bay. Um, this is just more, more detail here of data needs that Basically, the main themes are hydrodynamic sediment transport, climate change, and temporal and spatial resolution. I'm not going to go through all of these, but they're here. Um, so just in summary, opportunities to collaborate with the core. We have in-house in resources um, that, we, that U.S. Army Corps staff can interact directly with stakeholders. We have contracts where we can work with private industry with government orders that allows us to work with other federal um, agencies and cooperative agreements that allows us to work with universities and state entities, local governments. Uh, cl concluding remarks, uh, the Corps has been active in partnering with NANI's uh, principal investigators on um, various projects. Um, we have a diverse um, set of stakeholders, both federal, tribes, state, local, um, private industry, ports, research, resource agencies and NGOs. Um, as Rod mentioned, we're execution driven and um, a lot of the data that we, we have collected may not be um, known to a lot of our stakeholders and NANIS can be a good segue on how to incorporate that to broader use. So I think we need to look at some of that, how we can you know, feed some of that data that we've collected into the, the network. Um, and then coastal engineering, future focus areas and opportunities. Um, I think planning and adaptive management for coastal infrastructure is really key. We're, we have prime examples on how it's gonna look and we need to engage and, and make sure we have the data in place to, to do that um, uh, effectively. And then renewable energy, we, I just wanna state that the Corps does have a, a lot of knowledge of, and um, historic knowledge about morphology and, and inlets and uh, wave dynamics, and we can work together potentially to re reduce some of that duplication of effort. So um, that's, that's all I have, so thank you. Hans and David, thank you very much for that uh, very illuminating discussion of of Army Corps of Engineers uh, attributes, capabilities, and needs. And now I'd like to open it up for, for questions for these two gentlemen. I have one. <laughs> uh, 
as a regional representative of the Army Corps, is there, do you believe that there is, is, is strong buy-in by, by senior Corps leadership to, in fact, encourage uh, the Pacific Northwest entities in the Corps to become more actively involved with this particular RA and in general? Is that something that the, that the Corps wants to do nationwide? Um, well, we're here. <laughs> Actually, let me introduce <laughs> yeah. Brad Bird, who is our division leadership for all of hydraulic engineering in, in, in uh, Northwestern Division is here. Brad, can you ID yourself? Yeah, that's me. And the answer is yes. <laughs> and we've got a name, and we'll get there. So the chief engineering from Portland District will be our uh, member or whatever. And, and yes, we, we, we will. That's why we're here. And, and we've got the commitment from our senior leadership. And the, the general is uh, aware, but really unavailable to, to be in that position. But uh, uh, next best thing. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I congratulate the Army Corps on that. That's the kind of leadership that uh, it speaks well for our federal agencies. So I, I want to echo the Army Corps has been an absolutely strong partner. They've got a liaison officer in um, our U.S. National Office. It's our only other federal uh, partner. And uh, General Temple and General Walsh, who are at headquarters at Army Corps, are on board with this. And uh, I have the opportunity to speak with them regularly, so it's been a tremendous partnership, and I'm glad to see that you know that's been the aim of the Army Corps to have their members um, fully involved in the regions. I, I just have one of these. Um, it's not. This was not a geeky question. It's one of those admin questions that, on a comment you made that I've and that we've always understand. The Corps of Engineers has always been mission based and project oriented and you said that you're trying to go to a more systems approach to and could you illuminate us on what what does that mean you want to take a crack with ours <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I could i could try to answer that question well our we have a, a, a um our regional sediment management program which basically um looks at systems more holistically versus project-based. Uh, the prime example in, in this area is the Malta the Columbia River literal cell um, demonstration project where um, Rod and um, the Lower Columbia Solutions Group have really interacted with uh, various stakeholders um, to you know, really take a better look at how we manage sediment at that inlet and look at things on a more system-based approach than just, you know, we have to dredge the channel here. Where, we, where can we put this material? So, yeah. It's viewing sediment as something that's moving regardless of what project we're dredging or where we need to place it, and viewing it as a system, as a sediment shed rather than a project. And we're starting to move that way with some of the operation of, of other uh, business line elements too, but it's slow. Um, one thing about the core is that um, the adage about carpenters to measure twice and cut once, well, the core likes to measure about four times, <laughs> but we're getting there. In the spirit of the systems approach, is the core interested in uh, relatively real-time wave and current and, and sediment transport capability on an hour-to-hour -hour or day-to-day -day basis? I think uh, Dave, Dave, Dave and I and most of the core districts utilize the real-time observations for, in this case, coastal elements, uh, waves. Yes, uh, we are very much interested in that. Um, and we, we, during the wintertime, we're always looking at the, the NDBC uh, regional uh, assets and CDIP assets to seeing what's going on. We're looking at the, the uh, Wave Watch 3 forecast. We're looking at forecast 5 five days uh, ahead of us. We do the same thing for the uh, managing the rivers. We're looking at, we coordinate with regional uh, meteorologists and seeing what the 10-day forecast is. We, because a lot of our things are, we have to be able to respond real time. And so we, and that's why, that's a good view of, viewpoint of the systems management is that the meteorological systems affecting our infrastructure, we have a big picture view on that. It's just in terms of the funding um, the resourcing for specific projects. And if we have to fix a, a project element and we have the opportunity, we have a contractor on site, can we go ahead and fix another project element that's separately funded at the same time? It's very hard to do. 
Um, and then data collection, new types of data that are coming on, online. Let's say we want to collect some wave data at Tillam, offshore Tillamook. Is there a possibility we could bridge that with some other things going on that we know about? Uh, we can't put a wave buoy offshore uh, Neskowin because we don't have a project there. But maybe if we could share that asset at Tillamook for six months and then relocate it as a tactical wave buoy to Neskowin, we can, we can uh, collaborate and get two things done. Thank you for such a full answer. Any other questions? Let me ask a, a follow-up to Chris Moore's question then. Uh, on, the, on the slide you had with the, the various data types, which would be of extreme value to the core, so a lot of those are collected by other agencies. Does the core then maintain an investment in observations like water level, or do you rely on NOS to provide those? And would you want them to increase their investment, or NANUS, or other entities, or can the core do that and keep them there for the long term? I'm going to uh, bring in Bill Berkemeyer. Uh, Bill, <laughs> Bill is a, he's a, he's a agency asset for the core. And um, Bill, is that is that? Can I bring you in to answer that's how we maintain our, our wave gauging? Yeah, so let me try to answer that. And, and first, um, uh, for this audience, I, I think one of the things that uh, you guys are very fortunate to have in the Northwest here is some really great, knowledgeable folks within the core that care about this Northwest coastline and a, a real knowledgeable group here. So it's great, it's great for us to present. and and uh, realize you have here some really uh, dedicated folks. Um, the, the question on data is, it, is uh, we have a program which I manage which uh, sustains wave observations. We fund part of the CDIP program um, and independent of projects. Um, and, and so yes, we, and, and we've sort of focused on waves. We don't do water levels, we do waves. You can hear we, we like waves. We're sort of a one variable. Um, but we'll throw our wave information in, but we do need all these other data types. And one of the reasons we've been promoting IUS for a long time is because we, we look to p people who know these other data types much better than us to, to help with that. So we'll put some on the table, but we hope there's some other things on the table to take away. And, um, and we're trying to sustain our wave information, and even that's tough under this uh, uh, tough budget things, but, but finding users and applications, that really helps justify it within our structure as well. Thank you, Bill. I could just add on top of that, locally, uh, core districts uh, work with the USGS, and we, they do a lot of our river gauging for us and some water levels, turbidity assessments. And so uh, they do a very good job at that, and we bridge on to that. There's other opportunities where we do cooperative agreements or government orders with local agencies to collect data for us. Well, this might be uh, the opportunity to say that perhaps NANUS and the other RAs could serve as a handy venue for regional uh, entities of various federal agencies to come together and explore what these two fine gentlemen just said about, about data sharing and opportunities for collaboration. I hope that that would come to pass. Any further questions for our Army Corps professionals here? Then thank you very much, guys. Our, our last case study example of the day, but by far not the least, deals with hazard, uh, hazard response and marine operations. And we are uh, pleased today to welcome Commander Michael Schoonover yes. uh, and Captain Dan Jordan, uh, Captain from the Columbia River Bar Parts Association, and then Amy McFadden. And are you going to do this together or we'll just do it sequentially here, right? Okay. All yours, sir. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
I guess we are up for the final session. Uh, I think you'll see a transition here with this last session. Uh, many of the uh, talks up till now have been uh, very theoretically based, uh, a lot of uh, large words and uh, lots of data up on the screen, many of which were uh, over my head as an, as an operator and not a scientist. Um, where I'm going to bring it down to with my talk here is a discussion about uh, the tactical use of a lot of the data that's out there that's being produced. Um, the Coast Guard specifically uh, is a great consumer of data for a lot of our Coast Guard operations. Uh, we produce very little of it, um, but that data is critical for the ongoing Coast Guard operations that um, we run every day. So I'm going to talk specifically about Sector Puget Sound, and I'll cover a little bit uh, the region that that actually encompasses. Um, but the topics that I cover uh, also apply to our two Coast Guard sectors that make, uh, that are to the south of here that also make up the uh, Pacific Northwest region. Those would be sectors Columbia River and soon to be sector North Bend, uh, right now Group North Bend. So again, um, I'm the response chief at Coast Guard Sector Puget Sound. Uh, we run uh, all of the Coast Guard missions up here in Puget Sound with the exception of ice breaking. Um, unless things change here uh, soon, which I hear they're not getting any more ice, we're getting less ice, uh, not going to be a lot of ice breaking up here. But other than that, we do search and rescue, uh, maritime homeland security, protection of natural resources, which also includes oil and hazmat response, maritime safety, and national defense. Uh, the environmental pro products that are out there, the data that's out there, um, contributes to the Coast Guard's ability to execute all of these missions. Just a little bit about the unique AOR up here, and for any of you that operate on the water, you definitely know that uh, this is a very diverse um, geographical environment from offshore, uh, the area off of La Push, into the Straits of Juan de Fuca, Puget Sound, up in the San Juan Islands. Uh, the operating conditions in any of those areas um, are completely different. And so when we're running missions out on the coast, uh, the information that we need and what assets we're going to be sending differ greatly than when we are responding to a case up in the Swinomish Channel. Uh, this slide also just shows how large of an area it is. Uh, this is an overlay of the different captain of the port zones um, for some larger ports in the Coast Guard. And you really get to see, uh, certainly not an indication of volume, because all of these other ports run a lot of volume, but pure size-wise, um, this area encompasses a very large area. Uh, and how we overcome that large area is consolidating all of our operations uh, into one command control and communication center, which is located at Pier 36 in Seattle, the Puget Sound Joint Harbor Operations Center. Uh, for those of you that have not had the opportunity to come down there, uh, we routinely host tours for uh, all different types of groups, uh, industry groups, government groups, as well as uh, different just general organizations. So my contact information should be uh, with the uh, Nanus point of contacts. Uh, if you ever want to come in for a tour, we'd love to have, we'd love to have groups come down there. Um, as you see here, lots of computer screens, lots of sensors, uh, we kind of have information overload. And so our job there is really how do we consolidate all of that data into a usable product. Uh, one of the ways we do that is through our what's called the common operating picture. Uh, we integrate visual sensors with the cameras you see on the left and the right, infrared, radar, uh, satellite imagery, uh, weather data, and all of that comes into kind of one consolidated picture that gives us an idea of what's going on in the region and then how do we respond. Um, so with that as background, uh, I could have used any of our missions as an example of how we integrate environmental data. I thought it, search and rescue would be um, an interesting one because uh, generally a lot of folks hear and see that on the news uh, day to day. We run a lot of search and rescue operations in this region, general, generally anywhere from six to 700 cases a year. Um, so how we use environmental data for search and rescue kind of varies depending on what type of a case it is. But I really divide search and rescue into two phases, the search phase and the rescue phase, <laughs> appropriately named. Um, the rescue phase is actually pretty straightforward. It may be the most dangerous phase, but once you know where the person is, the boat is, or exactly what it is that you're looking for, um, going out and rescuing it is just a matter of selecting the best asset. And so really what we're using the environmental data there for is to determine based upon the prevailing conditions, uh, wave height, um, sea conditions, uh, visibility, current, 
uh, whether or not we need to send one of our small boats, whether or not we need to send one of our larger cutters, our helicopters, or some of our fixed-wing aircraft, really, because our, our sole mission there is we want to be able to uh, safely pull that person out of distress or that vessel out of distress uh, without unduly endangering our Coast Guard members. So with that, really, um, it's just a matter of getting real-time information uh, as well as good forecasted information so we can uh, send our crews out there uh, with all the right information. The search phase is actually a little bit more complicated, um, and we use some pretty sophisticated modeling software um, that uses a Monte Carlo simulation technique um, to do just that, to uh, project based upon our known assumptions. Sometimes we may know... In this case, uh, this is actually a, a, a run using our modeling tool where we had a uh, person fall off a ferry. And so we had a pretty good idea of where the initial datum was, the initial start of that search was, but then there were wind current uh, conditions pushing that uh, possible person in the water. And so as we did subsequent searches, uh, the system or the software basically modeled where that object in the water would drift. Um, that's very different than uh, what we often see offshore, which is a vessel that's reported leaving one place, not arriving somewhere else, uh, what we call an overdue. There's a large degree of uncertainty in there because we actually don't know when that vessel went into distress. And so sometimes the area that we'll be modeling might be 20 square miles, 50 square miles, 100 square miles. And the uncertainty grows um, exponentially as the search area increases. And so there... Uh, the data that we're feeding into that model, which uh, to a large part is all of the historical environmental data we have, plays a critical role in our ability to locate whatever object we happen to be searching for. Um, but once basically we have that drift rate and uh, the, the software models exactly uh, where those, the object that we're searching for would drift to, then what it does through an optimization process is determine basically based upon what assets we have out there searching, um, the best search grid to go on in order to find uh, whatever it is you're looking for. And that's what you see here with those patterns back and forth. Uh, those would be the type of patterns that our aircraft and our small boats and our cutters on scene would have been searching. So I could talk forever about search and rescue. That's what I grew up in the Coast Guard doing. I love it. Um, but uh, just real quick here, uh, oil spills. Oil uh, is near and dear, of course, uh, to protecting uh, the area here in Puget Sound, very sensitive area. And so, uh, so as we use the environmental data um, to do our oil sp or excuse me, our search and rescue analysis, we also use it for our oil spill analysis, leaning heavily on NOAA and our scientific support coordinators to determine uh, trajectories of oil as well as fate of oil uh, for the larger spills. This happened to be just a very small spill off of uh, West Seattle, but good visual. Uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to my panel members here, but uh, just ending, this is off of La Push, uh, that buoy that people talked about earlier today, uh, critical buoy for our surf stations there. Uh, actually, they get to go out and have fun when everyone else is staying in. Uh, I had the opportunity last Thursday of being the guy on the front boat uh, with a big smile on his face as we were shooting through that wave, but uh, they're one of the few teams that when things get nasty, that's when they like to go out and have fun. Our next speaker is Captain Dan Jordan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm a firm believer in uh, picture tells a thousand words. If, if you'd rather read, there's a fact sheet in the back of the room. <laughs> so, so the Columbia River Bar is where I work. I have fun in those waves as well. Um, it's worth noting before I go on with this that Columbia River is the third largest grain export gateway in the world, number one in wheat exports in the nation. Um, handles 42 million tons of international cargo valued at $20 billion annually. So quite, quite an economic engine. When we have rough weather out here, it shuts it all down. Um, trains, barges to Idaho, shuts the whole system down and, and costs a lot of money. So uh, that's where we rely on your data uh, to keep, keep it going. There's also a vibrant uh, crab industry and fishing industry as well there and can, can shut them down as well. So, so the Columbia River, you know, 100 miles, four competing independent ports. Um, 
you know, from Portland, Vancouver, on down to the river. In, in order for us to sail a ship out of Portland, we have to have 10 hours lead time uh, to set up tugboats and line handlers coming down the river before it crosses the bar. So we use real-time data off the wave buoys and uh, discussions with the National Weather Service as well to make that decision to sail the ships down the river. But once they go, there are no suitable anchorages in the river to stop a deeply loaded ship. So, so those forecasts are really important to us. Um, you know, the, the wave height can be off a little bit, um, and which it, it is quite often, but the timing is critical. And that coastal radar, the new Doppler radar, has is, is really improved the timing of the forecast. We're, we're really thankful to have that there. Um, so here's all the buoys. Uh, you've probably seen lots of different slides of these. These are rough numbers that we look at, though. It, it, I was a ship's captain before I was a pilot, and uh, ship's captains always have to second-guess forecasters. It's, it's just in our nature. So we look at the wave buoys as well. And, and uh, you can look at a buoy and say, well, roughly 18 hours from the wave at this buoy, it's going to be at the bar, and it gets to the next buoy. Is, is it really happening? Um, so, so the NDVC buoys, uh, they were critical to us. Um, but for a lot of years there, they weren't surviving the winter. You know, Rod showed you the hurricane force storms that came here. And, and either they would um, not transmit their data or they'd break loose their moorings and disappear. Um, and, and then we couldn't get them back on station until the summer. Uh, so we're all winter, the most critical time with no data. Uh, so in um, June of 2009, we had, you know, I've heard a lot of conversation today about collaborative partnerships. We had a wonderful collaborative partnership, 2009. We got together and tried to identify what's going on with these buoys and what can we do. The outcome of that was wonderful. NDBC uh, modified the moorings of their buoys and the communications package on their buoys, and they've been surviving the winter now. Um, that's great. Um, the Corps of Engineers funded a um, C-dip wave rider buoy that we put in really close to the bar, um, giving us real-time data for the bar. Um, very, very helpful there. Um, and, and they were wonderful. I have yeah, kudos to the Corps of Engineers on that. They had funding for the projects that Rod spoke of today, the regional sediment management, the jetties, the infrastructure. But they, they talked to all the interested parties, ourselves, the fishing fleets, the crabbing fleets. We were able to place that buoy in a position that worked for them and for us. Uh, so that was very helpful. Um, here, here's a before and after storm. <laughs> so, uh, and, and these are the, uh, the CDIP Way Rider buoys, which we have two out there now. The Corps of Engineers funded the inner one, and the Bar Pilots got, you know, we got a grant um, and funded the outer one off the continental shelf there so that the idea is the data from both of them, one measures waves where it feels the bottom, the other measures the waves where it doesn't feel the bottom, and you can come up with a better wave forecast that way. Now, I don't come up with a wave forecast, but you have National Weather Service. If this helps them, then wonderful. So the placement of that outer buoy, we funded it, but we let them choose you know, where to put it. Um, and, and hopefully we get better forecasts. We, we've been seeing some, uh, some great improvements from that. Um, so here's another placement idea. that the, One issue that we have, that, that it's the inshore wave rider buoy there. The currents out of the Columbia River uh, can be extreme at times, six, seven knots. Now, that plume goes out 11 miles from the Columbia River entrance. Any more than a two-knot current in that wave buoy goes underwater, doesn't transmit anymore. So we're not getting actual waves on the bar from that buoy. We're getting as close as possible and then letting the modelers try and model it, which also takes um, real-time current to be able to do that, which we don't have either. Um, so for those of you that would like to model the real-time current or uh, measure real-time currents out there, uh, we, we're all uh, open for it. So here's, here's um, from the NDBC site. They have this available for all the, all the uh, buoys that are out there. And, and we look at the peaks. We watch the storm coming in like that. Um, and at a certain point, we decide we can't take a ship out. We, we don't operate the ships, and all the trains and barges upriver uh, start complaining. Um, when, when we watch the storm drop off on the other side and waves get back into our operating levels, then we can start running ships again. But remember, we have to give them 10 hours notice for that. So that, that's, a, that's a real challenge. Forecasts are, are real important. Um, and this, this is just a great slide because there were two storms. We had a little window we could move ships. And the second, second storm came in, and we had to stop moving ships again. We've um, 
Scripps and the National Weather Service have done great jobs of tailoring their products to us on the websites. This is off the Scripps website uh, for the Sea Dip Buoy Program. Um, it's a 30-minute sample of all the waves that occurred at that buoy. So you know, we get significant wave heights from NDBC buoys, but we can get, uh, this shows the upper 10% and the maximum wave and, and f the full spectrum. So before I get on a ship and cross the bar, I can see what, what I'm going to encounter. If the maximum wave, like in this case, is 30 feet, you know, I, I look and are there a lot of waves near it? Do I have to worry about a whole lot of big waves or was it 30 foot and then the 22 foot was the next lower one? It helps, helps me decide you know, what I'm going to get involved in. Um, this is another uh, uh, slide from the uh, Scripps site. That outer wave buoy, not only is it off the continental shelf to do that comparison, but it's also right on the border of the Wave Watch 3 model and the SWAN model, so it helps the transition from one model to the other, um, which, which um, is providing a lot better modeling for us on the bar. And, and we, you can see there's differences there, but it's, it's fairly close. Now we get into the visuals. This is true to scale, a, a ship coming down the Columbia River, three, three foot between the bottom of the ship and the, and the uh, bottom of the channel. Uh, so we, we really pay attention to the tides as well. <laughs> uh, so so um, what this is a lead in for is another collaborative partnership that we did. Part of that grant, um, we've started what's called a dynamic underkeel clearance program. So you can tell looking at that picture, you really don't want the ship to move at all and hit the bottom. If it does, you want to know how much it moves. So, so this is what we're doing now. We're, we're currently in the process of this study and, and bringing in you know, lots of collaborative efforts on it. We're, we're measuring each component that makes the ship move. Water <coughs> density, tide, the, the squat, which is how the ship settles when it's moving, um, heel, and the wave response. I'm running out of time? Yeah. OK, <laughs> I'll move on. Um, so so it, there, there are a lot of people are, are leading into that. And we've also learned different tide datums there. A uh, lot of different tide datums on, on the river. And this is a bar forecast model that OSU has done for us. Uh, the top one there is showing uh, the blue line is at the wave rider buoy. The red line is modeled for the bar taking the currents into effect. Each one of those dotted lines is you know, now, three hours from now, six hours from now, 12 hours from now. And we get something like this from each one of those dotted lines, which is, is very helpful. And wave response is the largest thing. So I'll leave you one last thing. That's a picture of a ship going across the bar. And you can tell you know, how much uh, underkeel clearance we're losing on that one pretty easily. <laughs> Thank you. And Amy's next. Were you on board? I was. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, thanks, Jan, and thanks for inviting me to be a part of this today. It's been uh, really interesting and um, happy that you all stayed for this final session. I'm here um, representing the Emergency Response Division of NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration, which is part of the National Ocean Service. We're also um, known by our, our old name, which is still used frequently, which is uh, NOAA Hazmat, um, maybe more familiar to many of you. Um, the origins of our program are in this um, figure in the upper right, the Argo Merchant which was a spill which threatened the uh, George's Bank fishing area in, back in the 1970s. Obviously, it was a very, um, there was a lot of attention on it and a lot of sensitivity and a lot of conflicting information. Um, so I believe the Coast Guard asked NOAA to um, engage and be their scientific liaison on that spill. And since then, that relationship has been more formalized and under the National Contingency Plan, NOAA has the responsibility for providing scientific support to the federal on-scene coordinator for oil and hazardous material spills. And in the case of marine oil spills, the federal on-scene coordinator is the Coast Guard. Um, so in support of that mandate, uh, the Emergency Response Division provides 24 hour a day, seven day a week response, um, scientific support. Um, for response um, during spills. Uh, the scope encompasses the entire coastline, um, including the Great Lakes, Alaska, Hawaii, and U.S. territories. So whether the spill is in the Gulf of Alaska, the Gulf of Mexico, or the Gulf of Maine, um, 
we need to uh, provide that scientific support. So it's really important for us to engage um, with the regional uh, experts through things like the uh, regional associations. Uh, those scientific support roles, um, there's a numerous a variety of scientific su support roles that um, scientists from the Emergency Response Division um, might serve in um, from flying in overflights over the, over the oil to map out the surface oil distribution um, to looking at the resources at risk, whether natural resources or human use resources, uh, shoreline assessments, data management, um, looking at protection priorities and cleanup recommendations, and then the one I skipped over, which is oil movement forecast, which m where myself as an oceanographer um, usually helps out. And that, um, from the big spills um, like these ones, which are relatively infrequent, to the much smaller spills like the one we saw um, in the slide a few minutes ago in, Pug in Puget Sound, um, the oil movement forecasts are pretty much our most often, or most frequently request for, um, for scientific support. The Coast Guard needs to know where, where's the oil going to go? Is it going to impact a shoreline? Um, what do we need to do to, to react? Uh, just a, a cartoon here summarizing um, some of the physical or some of the processes that are important in um, predicting a oil trajectory m or a movement of oil. Um, and so the main processes being spreading of the oil on the surface due to gravity initially and then um, the ocean, horizontal ocean turbulence. A weathering of the oil, which is uh, biological, chemical, and physical transformations that uh, take place after the oil is spilled and then transport by the um, ocean currents. Um, the point here is that um, all these processes are highly dependent on the environmental conditions um, when the oil is spilled. So our key variables um, for looking at all these processes are the winds, ocean currents, and then uh, temperature. Other variables are important too. I just listed a few to give you a flavor of the um, observational data that um, is important to us and then um, most, so what's, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, so it's the, really the forecasts of um, ocean currents and ocean, um, or in the winds that we're using to predict the, um, the oil movement. Uh, so we um, can use forecasts of the winds and the ocean currents to run trajectories of oil particle or of um, oil in our trajectory model, which is uh, NOAA, the General NOAA Operational Modeling Environment. I don't um, want to go into detail about the model right now in the limited time here, um, but one of the points is that in as addition to using our in-house models, we can use uh, ex ocean currents um, from external models, uh, <coughs> Navy operational models, NOAA models, um, state agency run models, or um, models, some of the high res regional models that are run through the uh, IUS regional associations, like the one shown here on the right, which is Alex Kropov's model for the Oregon Shelf, which you've um, heard of already today. And that is a screenshot showing it with being used in our trajectory model to simulate a, a, a hypothetical spill off of Oregon. And as for, as far as the wind forecast, we rely on our friends at the National Weather Service for the forecast winds, and we have a great relationship with them where we can <coughs> call and get spot forecasts tailored for an incident. Um, so I think I can just leave it at that. Obviously, um, we've heard a lot about the value of observations for improving forecasts, and um, so we use observations directly in, a, in addition to the model forecast fields to validate the models that we're using um, for the data it's used for the assimilation, for constraining the forecast uncertainty, and also for looking at past movement of oil to, again, to validate uh, models. And our, our big requirement, uh, because we have a scope that encompasses all these different areas, um, really the idea of this one-stop shopping for observational um, data is, is really important. When you get a call at two in the morning, you are not gonna spend time looking at a a broad, you know, <laughs> spectrum of different sites for data. You really want to be able to pull it all together quickly. And I'm going to stop there. Great. Thank you all. A very fitting way to, to end 
our discussion sessions of the day with a, a, a very operationally focused panel uh, from search and rescue to, to crossing what is clearly a uh, demanding riverine bar system to actually the, how do we go about protecting uh, lives and property from oil spills and other hazardous model, materials that we can model. Uh, thank you all very much for that very good discussion. Uh, some questions, please, for our panel. Chris Moore is in the back. Hold it, Chris. <clears throat> the Coast Guard has done very well with quantifying their requirements for environmental information for search and rescue. Um, is your group ready to do that? Because that would be a big help in designing uh, the evolution of IUS if that was the case. <laughs> I think it, it would be very tough because of the broad spectrum of events that we deal with from, I mean, not that search and rescue applications aren't diverse, but with the different oil types and chemical spills, um, I'm, I'm not sure what that would look like. It might be worth looking at what the Coast Guard does to, to, make, to quantify their requirements, and I bet you could, could make a stab at it. With, with the understanding that it'll, it'll improve as you evolve it over time, too. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a general search and rescue question. Sorry, Bill, real, real quick. <clears throat> to either the commander or, or Stenka or Mike Cosro or some combination thereof. But on the East Coast, the feasibility studies that looked at, uh, at CODAR information and improving search and rescue trajectory tracks, uh, is, that going, is that going to be exported nationwide, or is that going to be, yes. Stank, hold on. So the answer is yes. Um, under development from IUS, um, the short-term prediction system, which is that forecast that SARops needs, mm -hmm. um, has been developed for the regions where we have HF radar. And we work with Art Allen, who um, is at their research center in, in uh, Connecticut, it's Art in Connecticut, who develops SARops. So what has to happen in an operational mission is it's on the developmental service server. And then the Coast Guard will bring that into their operational system by releases. And then the training has to occur now as a Coast Guard um, uh, area commander, they have access to the environmental data server that is not the operational, and they can get to that. But we are close to bringing the entire, where we have HF radar, this SDPS short-term predictive system, um, into the operational center for the Coast Guard, so you'll have access to it from SARops, because right now here on the West Coast, you still have to go to your developmental server. So that's what we're doing at the national level. And then I'll let you take for what you're doing at the level here. Thanks, Tinka. Sure. Um, so I think th that's actually great to hear because for us, um, every step we can take in the direction of getting more accurate data and better representation that feed or better data that feeds into the model, which then represents where whatever object we're searching for would drift. It just makes our searches that much shorter, and especially here in the Pacific Northwest where I was actually on the uh, Nanus uh, uh, iPhone application a little while ago, which is great. I hadn't downloaded that before today. That's fantastic. But looking at the water temperature at the La Push buoy, and I think it was 43 degrees right now, um, the survivability rate, um, unless you're in a life raft or even a um, even in anti-exposure coveralls or, or gumby suit is, is pretty short. And so the quicker we can find someone, the better. Uh, just from my observations out here, I've been out here about seven months now. Our, our offshore data is actually very good. When, when we're searching, generally what we end, where we end up finding it is where the models are telling us. Where we run into challenges is inside of uh, Puget Sound. And part of that is just the lack of data, but part of it it's also it's just a very geographically diverse area and trying to model the Hood Canal or um, the areas up in the San Juan Islands where there's just so many inlets and, and diverging 
currents, winds, and everything else is challenging. And I don't know, I'm not certainly a scientist, but I don't know that we're ever going to be able to crack that nut, but we're certainly getting better. Thank you. Bill? Uh, Bill Berkmeyer with the Corps. Uh, this is for Dan, the, the uh, compelling tale because of, of uh, observing with an applica direct application. One, one question is, how close are we to the right result? In other words, you said, you know, you got to have 10 hours. How often do you blow it with the information you have? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, we haven't hit the bottom in a lot of years. Uh, so, so we haven't blown it, uh, in my memory anyways. Uh, if anything, I think we're blowing it on the conservative side. Uh, so sh ships that could sail, you know, they're losing a little bit of money because we're, we're being too conservative. Uh, but I, I'd rather err that way. Um, the, the study that we're doing right now, we should have results out on that um, this fall. And, and uh, it, it'll actually generate a, a computer program that, that will give us a better tool to work with. David Jones, back here. Hi, David Jones from uh, APLUW. This is for uh, Captain Jordan. Just curious on uh, where does that decision get made? Is it made first by just the, the pilot that's going to be going out with that ship, or is it done uh, at a, a center? Because I was wondering, you have a lot of different data, and, and there's probably some experience in putting all that together. I mean, have you been able to fuse all that in a kind of a, a fusion center? Well, it's, it's, it's both, the pilot going out and a center, but <coughs> the pilot going out is at that center. We're a really small group. There's only 14 of us, seven on duty at a time. When, when a storm's approaching, we usually have at least a day, sometimes more notice um, that it's coming. And, and as it gets close, a few of us will get together and make that decision. Uh, but once the ship's sailed, um, you know, you're pretty much committed to go. Uh, there have been a few ships that have anchored um, because a, a storm has stalled, um, but the ship was going, and, and you, know, you have to err on the side of safety. So, so um, you, know, you can't anchor in the channel, but the Coast Guard doesn't like that. Thanks, Captain. You, sir, and then you're next. Uh, Jerry Joyce, Moon Joyce Resources. <clears throat> you, you, uh, man, there's been a lot of discussion about getting real-time data, how valuable it is to see it immediately. But, uh, for example, when we have an oil spill, uh, you're modeling away, but those things aren't out to the public. They're out to the joint uh, information center who releases it, and maybe we'll get it that day, or maybe we'll get it a day later. Shouldn't, if you're using all this data, you know, real time that's coming from all these different organizations, shouldn't the result, your products, be available also freely rather than have it censored through the Joint Command? I, I agree with you, uh, and I think that was the case um, in Deepwater Horizon um, after the first few weeks. I, I think that in a lot of cases with things like the surface oil forecasts, the events over within, for, for the typical spills that we do, um, by the time it's, it's asked for, basically the incident is over, the oil's on the beach, we're not producing them anymore. Um, but I, I, I think because of the attention and the, and the demand for those products during Deepwater Horizon, I, I, I think that they will be publicly available after, in, in the future. And then certainly the satellite analysis that was done by Noah Nesdis, they were putting that out as well in near real time. I think the public was getting it at the same um, time as us later in the spill. So I think it was, it was one of those questions where no one had asked for it before. Um, but I'm fairly new to um, HAZMAT, so okay. I don't know if, okay. well, if your experience you know, is different. It, like you said, you need the information within the first few days, mm -hmm. but it took weeks for that. Uh, if it's not institutionalized now, it's going to take weeks again before it gets released out to the public. So, I mean, I, I hope that it becomes institutionalized so that we can have it. We have our own, you know, I, I work with Audubon, so we put people out to scope out where the birds are mm -hmm. and it report that actually back to the agencies. And without having the real-time data, uh, we'll never know where to go. So I hope it becomes institutionalized. And I could provide one perspective from the uh, FOSC, the Federal On-Scene Coordinator, um, for, an, for an event. I mean, we don't even have access to real-time. There's no real-time click a button, get a beautiful model system, at least 
that, I, that we use right now. I mean, the, when there's an event or an oil spill that's going to require the stand-up of, of an incident command or even one of the smaller events, we actually use scientific support um, from NOAA for the landing craft just in the slide I showed. Uh, they actually sent someone down to our, our command center. Um, we actually, as a federal unseen commander, will submit the request for a specific analysis to NOAA. Um, they have to do that analysis. Once we receive that analysis back, um, and oftentimes they are in the command center or the incident command with the Coast Guard, the state, the responsible party, everyone, um, then that immediately gets released out as part of either a press release or just um, for larger events, we'll actually have, there'll be some sort of a, a website stood up for that. So I would say it's released as close to <clears throat> real time or near time as the person that's going to be using that for actual operational command and control is getting it. Um, so, and especially for future large scale events, I think you'll see much better reporting in the future. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Brian Zelenke uh, here with NOAA and question for Captain Jordan. You mentioned uh, an interest in currents in the Columbia River Bar, and I was wondering if you could comment on the utility of the CODAR CSON HF radar surface currents measured in that area. I'm not aware that they're doing that on the Columbia River Bar. Um, it, it, you are. Is it on the NANU site? I'll look for it. <laughs> may, I, may I pass the microphone okay. to Dr. Mike Cosro? Uh, yeah, we we are making we are making measurements uh, of the Columbia River outflow. There, uh, the technique the, the the HF technique has trouble when the currents get as large as they do right at the mouth. So, we don't do a good job when they get up at uh, three meters a second. Uh -huh. But, it, not not it takes it doesn't take long for them to come down below to where we are able to measure them, and that's the region that the waves pass through where you need to right. to do the, right. the wave shoaling so the, the modeling that I'm aware of that we're doing um, is using the currents through the CMOP Center and Antonio Baptista's work um, but, but um, I, I, I'm not aware of what you're doing so I, I'd like to talk to you more about that absolutely love to yeah this is uh, Andy Lanier with the Oregon Coastal Management Program and I guess I was thinking after hearing you guys talk that I didn't hear anything about vessel traffic monitoring and wondering if you guys, how you do that, how you account for um, patterns of movement over time, if you, if you keep track of that or if you use automated information systems to basically monitor the ships as they're moving uh, up and down the coast or in and out of the river channels. I can cover part of that. I can at least cover that for Puget Sound. Um, so Puget Sound is one of the areas where there is an established vessel traffic service, which is, um, I mean, essentially similar to an air traffic control tower on the water, although they give less direction than air traffic controllers would give to aircraft. They only intervene uh, if there's an imminent collision or, or something that's going to happen. So for vessels that are above a certain size that are required to be part of that vessel traffic uh, scheme coming in and out of uh, the Straits and Puget Sound, they do track data on those vessel movements and because they are all have uh, automatic identification system, AIS on board. Uh, we have a series of uh, radars and um, AIS receivers that essentially allow the Coast Guard to track those vessels from far offshore and it's, it's a partnership between the U.S. and Canada because the vessels are handed off as they come in through the straits. Um, they, they shift between Canadian waters, U.S. waters, and so it's a joint vessel traffic service. So we share the data between the Canadians and the, and the U.S. on those larger vessels. Um, for smaller vessels that aren't required to be part of the vessel traffic system, um, we don't have any specific way to track them other than if they happen to fall into some of our other sensors that our Jayhawk happens to have uh, on the water for Homeland Security purposes. But it's not nearly as robust as with the larger vessels. Thanks, Commander. And with that, I'm going to have to draw this uh, particular session to a close. I, I ask to, we thank uh, not just these panel members, but all our panel members that gave such exciting and informative talks today.
Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm actually wired for sound already. And so I'm happy to uh, say that I'm standing in between you and a wonderful reception that's about to begin. But I do want to share some words with you. I have three things that I would like to say in four quick announcements. And, and, and they're really important to me. And, and, and the first one is, is um, the sense of gratitude. And I extend what David said and I, on behalf of all of NANUS. I thank you all, the 150 individuals who chose to spend your time today with us in this room talking about this and, and giving us your input and your insights. Um, I really thank you for making that decision. We know how busy people are. And I echo what David said about all of the speakers who spoke. Um, it was an incredibly talented bunch of people that we had. Um, we have a beautiful program that is in the lobby that has their speaker bios in it. So I encourage you to get to know these people better because they, they, they bring an enormous amount of talent to the region and I thank them for their participation. And then also we mentioned our, our organizing committee that, that put this, this um, event on. And they are also listed in this, in this program. And, and I'm going to read their names because it is these people who every two weeks got on a phone call. This, this event did not happen because, oh, there's a cookie cutter way to do it. It was because of people's really good ideas of how to put that together. Bill Dewey with Taylor Shellfish, Jack Dunnigan of the Army Corps of Engineers, Ken Zimbel with the Puget Sound Partnership, Rob Fotlin with Microsoft Research, Mike Cosro with o Oregon State University, Norge Larson with Seabird Electronics, um, Chris Moores with Portland State University, Jay Perlman with the Institute of Electrical and Eco Electronics Engineers, Steve Rumrill with the State of Oregon, Joe Schumacher from the Quinault Indian Nation, Rick Spinrad, Spinrad from OSU, Steve Usakai from the Boeing Company, and Timmy Van from our NOAA office here at, at Montlake. They were joined, this is our local group, they were joined by Jessica Snowden from the, the IUS office out of DC with Stenka Willis, and also our, our leaders in, in putting this on through the IOOC, the Interagency Ocean Observing Com Committee, Ralph Rayner, Nick Rome, and Josh Young. This has been a fantastic team to work with, and I thank you so much. Okay, that was message number one. Message number two, um, we've heard some really excellent feedback today to NANUS. And, and what I've heard are, are some feedback of, about our successes. And I can't tell you as, as someone involved in, in NANUS how, how wonderful it is to hear those things. But I really want to underscore that it is the diverse people, some of whom you've heard their names mentioned today, some many of whom you have not. And I want to make a point here because the people of NANUS, I think they sort of self-select. These are not people who are out for fame or ego or money or power. You don't join an ocean observing system for those reasons because those things don't exist. Um, you join an ocean observing system because you think that you might have ideas about how to solve problems, because you think that you might have ideas about how to bring things that are disparately separate and bringing them together, and, and because you're creative and that you might have good ideas and that you're willing to work well with others. And I've been involved in a lot of projects, some leaders, some as a, as a, as a, a partner, and I have to tell you that being the director of NANUS is one of the things that gives me the best pleasure in terms of working with people. We have good people, and that's what makes NANUS what it is. And so I want to thank them, and I want to welcome you all into the collective NANUS family as you, as you see fit and as we go forward. OK, we also heard a lot about challenges. And to be quite frank, some of our most difficult challenges came right in that first discussion, money problems of data quality and how to assure these things. And, and then also that crevasse with science policy and the struggle there, okay? These are not new, new problems. These are pervasive problems um, globally. Um, but these are problems that I have heard from the IOOC leadership co-chairs, from Zdanka Willis, um, director of IUS, and from NANUS that, okay, you know, in a way, 
can I say it, damn the torpedoes. You know, we can't just give up. So what kind of a nation do you want to live in? What kind of a nation do you want to build? And so these are real problems. They're difficult to address, but we have to do our best, okay? So, so we're going forward with those. And what's exhilarating to me is that I'm hearing that from the highest levels down. And I really want to thank the IOC for their leadership in that. All right. There's other challenges, though, that are maybe the next level down. And, and we heard some of those today, things like the time scales um, differences and the connections, how to better reach our audience, um, how we can improve on our products, both in the short term sorts of things that we can be doing now and in the long term things that we can be doing now. And those are really exciting to me because those are some things that we can put some great creative energy into this. This workshop is not a one-off. It's not a one-and-done is what I meant. This is the start, okay? And, and for many of you, um, about 50 of you, you've chosen to, to spend another day with us tomorrow. We're going to start having those conversations. But we're not going to end there, okay? This is an iterative process. We need your, your, your constant input to it and nurturing. Um, so I'm excited. So that's my third message, is, is that we've, we've heard about our successes, we've, we've heard about our, our challenges. Um, and, and I summarize that, this last part up by saying that despite what the calendar says, this is not Groundhog Day. <laughs> in the sense of that silly movie we're all thinking about, this is definitely not sticking in our mode and, and just doing status quo. So, so um, I, I thank you for that energy, and I, and I know it's going to continue. So, well, I've got your mention on Friday. I want to call your attention. It is also in the lovely program. We have two things going on tomorrow. We're going to be in a different building. This is building 33. There's a building 99, right? Yes. And we're going to be in building 99. And, and you've all got the directions on how to get there. We're going to start at 8.30, um, once again, with Rob Fotland with Microsoft Research, starting a session on new collaborations. We heard a lot of really cool ideas. And, and, and this is a wonderful think tank. Let's, let's think about some of these new things that we could maybe do together. All right, so that's our first session from 8.30 to 10.30. Then um, we're going to take a little break, and from 11 to 1, we want your, your ideas on enhancing observations. We've heard a lot of ideas thrown out today, and we've heard some things that I know people are sitting on and they're thinking about. Things about how to achieve optimum integration, things about how to encourage wider participation, and things about how to secure and sustain the improved engagement of, of all users. So, so that's what we're going to focus on tomorrow in our Friday morning. And then we're going to really get a treat, because one of our co-sponsors of this event, Seabird Electronics, who has a wonderful display in the back there, is going to uh, have a lunch and open house at their facility, which is very close by. And so um, I encourage you to visit the folks back there at the Seabird booth. They're going to give tours. I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful time. They're, they're incredible hosts. So I want to conclude um, by thanking not only Seabird, but our other sponsors. Um, I always say it wrong. Sonar Dine, sorry. And Reed Exhibitions, um, who have been very generous in, in their um, sponsorship of this. The Puget Sound Partnership. Um, and I have to conclude, last and certainly not least, Microsoft Research, Rob Fotland, thank you so much for your representation of your company and your goodwill in, in working with us to get this going. Not only is this a wonderful venue, it's um, you have recycling. <laughs> you have a healthy environment. You have a, a place that, that your generosity is, is, you know, you go around the corner and there's, there's a nice soda that you can have. And, and this is just a really fertile and wonderful, your hospitality has been great. We thank you for that. I know that you've got a reception waiting for us and I can't thank you enough. We look forward to, to this in, in continuing intellectual enterprise here together. But thank you very much to Microsoft Research. So thank you all. <laughs>